So we have been, we're in the midst of a big struggle, and they also came, had a delegation in the anti-war demonstration, and they spoke from the stage, gave a very militant speech, uh, you know, and, and really about the uniting of these different issues and struggles. And also we're working with other community organizations in doing this. And then, and these are kind of all things that are happening almost at the same time. And May 1st is coming up. On May 1st, uh, there's a coalition that's formed. We helped to form the coalition. Uh, and it's going to be a day of uh, International Workers' Day, also Immigrant Rights Day, and also a day of saying, you know, no cutbacks, money for people's needs, not for war. So there's going to be a march from the Mission District, which is where our, uh, we have a pretty large office there. And uh, it's the main Latino district of the city going down to the city hall. And then we have people who are in the different unions, like the, uh, the sign and display union. Gloria Lariva, I don't know if any of you have heard of her, but she's uh, the president of the typographical union, which has been under big attack. She's also the national coordinator of the committee to free the Cuban five that, um, uh, that Greg was talking about just before the meeting started. Um, so, and, and then there is the Cuban five case itself. And the Cuban five case is a case that uh, it also shares the same office. It's the same, it's the national office there. And, uh, you know, uh, right now, there's, uh, the Obama administration is actually stepping up the offensive against Cuba. Because of the world economic crisis, and because there is not a socialist camp or socialist bloc in the world anymore since the fall of the Soviet Union 20 years ago, it made Cuba, which didn't have to think about this back then, not, you know, it integrated Cuba to a certain extent into the world capitalist market or made it influenced much more by the world capitalist market, although it retains a very socialized economy. So uh, it's, you know, in all of the countries, the economic crisis is particularly hitting the poor countries uh, even much harder than it is the, the advanced capitalist countries. And then we also have uh, the election campaigns going on. And you can see the flyers for this. Uh, in California, we're running candidates for governor and secretary of state. And also Gloria is running against Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi, who's the Speaker of the House, of course, uh, in, and is from San Francisco. And it expresses, I, I think, all of these different struggles. Like, our understanding, um, we are a Marxist party, we are also a Leninist party, but we do not describe ourselves as Marxist-Leninist, which might sound like a, a small technicality. But in the world today, when pe people identify themselves as Marxist-Leninist, it usually means they support Stalin. They're supporters of Stalin, that they have a Stalinist view or you know, sympathetic to Stalin. Well, we're not. We're also not Trotskyist. Uh, we're not either one of those. Uh, but we do take from Lenin some things that we consider to be extremely important. One of those is that Lenin was very strong on principle. I mean, very, very firm on principle. And I think that it's worth looking at Lenin since he was the leader of the first successful revolution. But he was extremely flexible in tactics. And Lenin had very, it was very interesting. He came from the middle class himself. <clears throat> I mean, the real middle class. But he immersed himself in understanding the working class and the peasants, who were the great majority in, in society at that time. And throughout his whole time leading up to the revolution, whenever there was an organization that involved workers, even if it was a religious organization, like in the 1905 revolution, there was the priest who led a an organization. Lenin was very interested in that organization. And very interested in, in speaking to workers in, in the language that workers could respond to. And, uh, and also, that to, to be able to see where the struggle was and go to where the struggle was. Um, but to be able to be in all these different uh, arenas of, of struggle. Lenin is very interesting, and a lot of times Lenin is taken wrong, I would say, because People, in the, when they're polemicizing or arguing with each other, different Marxist groups, they'll invoke Lenin and they'll quote Lenin, one part of Lenin, but if you only look at one part of Lenin, you don't really understand Lenin. Like Lenin wrote things that sound exactly the opposite at different times of what he said in an earlier time. Because he believed that there had to be a great flexibility in tactics according to the, the time. So I don't know how much of you, uh, how much you know about Lenin, uh, or you've talked about Lenin, but like for instance, the big struggle that caused the split in 1902 and 1903 in the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party between the Bolsheviks, which he led, and the Mensheviks, 
was over Lenin's insistence that you couldn't just be a supporter of the party, you had to be, you had to take responsibility for work. You had to be involved in work. And he said, we want a party of professional revolutionaries. He didn't mean just people who worked full time for the party, because obviously everybody can't do that, but people who were that dedicated and that they would undertake work and not just be, like in a lot of the socialist parties at that time, including the one here that was pretty big, a lot of times the leaders were people, they would be ministers or they would be, you know, something else and they would come and they would give the speeches on Saturday. And then the other people who worked in the office and did all the work and created the leaflets and handed out the leaflets and, you know, went to the picket lines, that wouldn't be the leaders. And Lenin rejected that idea altogether of a party. He said, you know, we have to have a party that the, the, the leadership is not some elevated position. Leadership is a division of labor. And everybody has to work in the party. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Another thing about Lenin that I think is interesting and that we, I, I can say this about ourselves. And I remember when I first became an activist in the time of the Vietnam War in the late 60s and early 70s, especially in the late 60s, there was always a great frustration that we were talking, some of us earlier today, um, we're having lunch about the romanticization of the 60s, like things just, the idea you would go, all these things just kind of barreled forward, which wasn't true. You know, there would be these massive demonstrations and sometimes huge numbers of people would get arrested, and then you'd go back to your city, and that would happen in Washington or New York, and then you'd go back to your city or town and you'd say, well, what the hell do we do now? And, and that was kind of like people were constantly tormented by that, and also tormented by the fact, and I think this is one of the things that that gets to activists more than almost anything else is how do we, how come people don't respond more to our message? How come, you know, how can we make people respond more? Which is actually an impossibility. Uh, and, and so you can get over the frustration in a way by realizing you can't make people interested in something. You know, it's actually impossible. They become interested, uh, and, and, but I'll say a little bit more about that, but the, the idea that um, there would, what do you do? What do you really do in relation to this struggle? What do we do as conscious people? Because uh, the people in this room are consci all conscious people. We have consciousness. And what we want to do is see a mass movement because we understand that without a mass movement, there can't be revolution. And without revolution, without a change, without, the, the, without an end to this power of the capitalist class, we cannot really address any of the fundamental issues society. We can't talk about the environment. We can't really deal with the environment. I mean, that's a big pressing issue. As long as profit remains the driving force of society, and of, of those who, it's the driving force of society as long as the capitalist class is the ruling class. As long as they are the ruling class and they are making the decisions about what to produce and what not to produce, and they control the resources, then it's impossible. We should fight for the reforms. But it's impossible to actually solve that issue or any other issue. And that goes for racism, or it goes for sexism, and it goes for the, the, uh, the cutbacks that are happening, and the cost of education, and the health care crisis. I believe that what, one of the things the health care crisis proves, and even the health care, the, the so-called resolution to it, the health care bill, is something that I've actually thought for a long time, is that most of the time when people are progressive, progressive people think, well, we'll have health care reform on the way to revolution. I believe we'll have real health care reform after we have a revolution. That it would be easier to have a revolution than it will be under this system to actually change the health care system. It's so bad and it's so profit driven. So in order to get to where we have to go, we can, we can only get there uh, through a mass movement, a mass workers movement. That also brings in other parts of society. But the working class in the United States is enormous. I mean, this is one of the things that there's a conscious campaign to hide from the people. That, you know, the idea that we're all the middle class. And even the unions do this too. They put out flyers and, you know, I see them and they say, let's work together to rebuild the middle class. You're not the middle class, you're the working class. Everybody who has to sell their labor, their ability to work in order to live, who doesn't own their own means of production, is the working class. It's part of the working class, but we, you know, I mean the whole thing of Labor Day being in September and the middle class propaganda, 
That's all to make people here, to make workers here, believe that there's something different than what they really are. And also that they're separate from the workers in other countries. And of course, that's part of our battle.